Welcome back to Men and the City. In today's video, we are going to talk about the radicalization of young men. It's a refreshing day outside. It's not too cold, it's not too hot. But this is going to be a fairly long and engaging video. So get some coffee and tea and the usual and strap yourself in. I recently saw a podcast. I think it was hosted by Tim Pool, who most of you know, and folks like Rolo Tomasi, some other fairly well-known people in the manosphere and beyond. And the subject of the podcast was the decline of Western men. And while I, I think these discussions, which began, I, I think, in earnest probably 10 years ago and have only gained momentum over the last decade, they're very fruitful because they, they're beginning to bring to light sort of the underbelly of trauma and frustration, many of the things that we talk about on this channel. But I don't think that these discussions do justice to what is really happening in the psyches of young men, especially in the West. And the reason for that is because there is not a sufficient depth of understanding of the past, a context for how we arrived where we have. And I think a, a particular frame of mind is necessary to elucidate that perspective and by extension to help us understand where we are headed, which of course is what neo-masculinity is all about. It's not about the past as much. It's not even about documenting the present. Most of the manosphere is about those things. This channel is about the future. It is about where we are headed and ultimately what is happening in the psyches of young men that's gonna pave the way to the future. I also recently saw an interview, which I think is an appropriate departure point for today's discussion between Elon Musk and Don Lemon. I'll link to, to these below, but in this discussion, Don Lemon is adamant that Elon Musk acknowledge that there is a kind of systemic racism or a systemic oppression of specific groups of people. Of course, we know who they are and we know what their argument is. But what I, th I found particularly interesting about the interview was not the usual tropes or traps that we've seen played and replayed for decades now uh, by the left to trap you into saying something that's ill-advised or that's self-condemning -con or incriminating. But what Elon Musk responded by saying, more or less, is that where, whereas Lemon may have a point that there, there may be certain systemic problems here and there, that it does not serve a purpose to discuss them anymore. And, and can't we just set them aside and, and move ahead? And I, I do think that that is a very commonplace argument made by people on the right today who think, I think rather naively, that the past is something that we can just sort of forget and move on. And, and so it is upon that subject, really, that I want to talk about today. Amnesia is a form of narcissism. Willful ignorance of the past is about self-absorption because it renders all of the things that have come before us, the, the past traumas, the lost wars, the victorious battles, the consolidation of civilization and its fall in some sense, irrelevant and blank slates the present and, and leads to a, a future of whatever destination you so determine. And that's a very childlike, infantile interpretation of the world. And this is what the left, uh, you might say, communism seizes upon, is this desire to eliminate anything that's external from the struggle of the oppressed and, and oppressor, which is center stage. And of course, it's ironic in some sense because these same groups of people that want to blank slate everything are obsessed with a legacy of this or a legacy of that as we know. But what is it that brought the Western mind and young men today to the point where we are? 
There are two main strategies, I think, that enable the weak to bring down the strong. One of these strategies, or the, the, more, the more commonly known strategy, is for the weak to leverage their numbers, to, to gain up on the strong, and by overpowering them with mass, to bring them down. This is democratic politics today, right? It's, it's the motivation for mass immigration. If you can't persuade or cajole or, or coerce an outcome, then redistribute the demographics so that you can win. Again, it's, it's a mass mobilization of the weak to bring down the strong. However, there is a far more menacing, sinister, and insidious strategy that I think has been wielded with extreme precision against Western men. And that is to convince the strong that he or they are in fact not strong. And that by being strong or demonstrating your strength, you were in fact demonstrating weakness. An example, I suppose, of this is analogous to an athlete, a star athlete, who is summarily criticized in the press, maybe for being selfish or a ball hog or something like that. And so he is coerced into changing the nature of his, of his game to assimilate into a broader team. Now, sometimes that criticism is well-founded, sometimes it isn't, but either way, there's a, a psychological effect that impedes the dominance of that individual player. And some of the, the strongest minds in sports have gone through things like that, people like Michael Jordan, as an example. So it, it can be very effective. That being said, the, the question that I'm sure all of you are asking as I go through this is, well, how could a strong person be susceptible to that argument? How could they, in fact, be coerced, especially if they are strong? Well, the answer, it seems, is a kind of emotional or psychological trauma. In other words, some kind of event that shakes that core foundation of confidence and creates doubt in the, the psyches of the strong, makes them second guess themselves and change their behavior on that basis. Well, the starting point, I, I think, for the decline or the trauma that opened the door to the strong being cajoled and psychologically traumatized was World War I. Now you might think that that's rather bizarre, but as I said at the beginning, amnesia is a big part. It's an enabler in this entire discussion because World War I was a devastating war for the world. The United States included. It led to some very catastrophic consequences. And without going into the detail of that, I, I think it's noteworthy that one of the foremost literary writers in the history of the United States, a man named Ernest Hemingway, who wrote extensively about masculinity, was utterly traumatized by that war. Because Hemingway was very much a Victorian in his thinking. It was how his mind was cultivated. In other words, he believed in the heroicism of the, the masculine archetype, the warrior ethos, fighting the good fight, demonstrating courage and valor and so forth on the battlefield. Those were things that animated and strengthened the West for thousands of years, you might say, and underpinned, provided ballast for the masculine psyche. But World War I changed all that. It shook up the world, specifically the Western world. And it set us down a path that we're still recovering from to this very day. And I, I want to read a, a brief quote from Hemingway that I think captures a little bit of this from a book called The Sun Also Rises that I'm sure some of you, maybe most of you have heard of. 
he says, I got hurt in the war. This is the main character. Oh, that dirty war. We would probably have gone on and discussed the war and agreed that it was in reality a calamity for civilization and perhaps would have been better avoided. It was a calamity of civilization and it did hurt the psyche of the West as embodied in young men. That's why we refer to the World War I generation as the lost generation. Now, many people, historians, public intellectuals, and the like, will tell you that we recovered from that experience by fighting the good fight in the Second War, but that's not really the case. And actually, what is increasingly surf surfacing in the public consciousness, not just in the United States, but throughout the Western world, is that World War II wasn't exactly what we've been told it is either. That both of these wars were cataclysmic and that the true victor of the Second War was not the West and it certainly wasn't democracy. It was communism and communism spread not just under the umbrella of the Soviet Union, but carried to the United States by a very specific group of people that we refer to today as, as globalists, who were involved and have been instrumental in exploiting the trauma and therefore the, the shaken confidence in the psyches of young men to their ends. Everything essentially springs from that. Feminism, wokeism, transgenderism, the, the spread of this kind of intellectual narcotic, and we use the umbrella term today, globalism, to describe it, would never have been possible without the trauma of the wor world wars, which sufficiently weakened the, the psychological immune system of men to the point where our confidence was shaken and our resistance to some of these cancerous ideas was eliminated. And so what was left in its wake was a porous border of emotional distemper and psychological demoralization. How is it that we can recover from something like this? Well, that's what's really interesting in this discussion because I think we are in the process of recovering. Part of the reason for that is simply time. Time does tend to heal all wounds, whether they are physical or psychological, if, if those wounds aren't fatal. And rest assured, the world wars, however terrible they may have been, were not fatal, thank God. They could have been, but they were not. That brings us to the present moment, however. As we, as millennials and Zoomers, move very quickly with speed away from the traumatizing events of the past, specifically of World War I and World War II, our minds are opening to a reinterpretation of the context within which we live today. And that has stimulated a new awakening, a new awareness of the social problems that we face. And in that process, there has been a kind of radicalization. And that radicalization makes perfect sense. I, I would describe it as a hardening, a solidifying of resistance, just as the baby boomers and the Gen Xers, and maybe even the, the so-called greatest generation, just as their resistance, their immune system was so weakened, ours is actually becoming stronger we are psychologically processing the legacy of their trauma and waking up on that basis. Part of what's happening here is that men are shifting away from victimization, from what some psychologists call the external locus of control. You know, the idea that we are not the agents of our own fate, 
we have no control, we have no power. It's, it's a disempowering ethos. It's the reason for safe spaces and microaggressions and all the rest of it. it it's basically a psychological weapon. But like I said, that weapon can only work if there is a trauma that shakes the confidence of the stronger. And so we, young men, being the stronger, are beginning to wake up. We're beginning to regain a sense of self-confidence born of that awakening. The next step in this evolution, if that's what you want to call it, this psychological permutation, is that we are turning to a new cadre of leadership. We're looking for new voices that are charismatic. Now, Max Weber, who I, I mentioned on this channel more than a few times, wrote some interesting things about charisma in particular. And I want to read one of them, which comes from a book, I think, called Economy and Society, and specifically comes from a chapter called Charisma and Its Transformations. But listen to what Weber has to say here. All extraordinary needs, i.e. those which transcend the sphere of everyday economic routines, have always been satisfied in an entirely heterogeneous manner, a charismatic basis. It means that following that the natural leaders in moments of distress, whether psychic, physical, economic, ethical, religious, or political, were neither appointed office holders nor professionals in the present day sense, i.e. persons performing against compensation a profession based on training and special expertise, but rather the bearers of specific gifts of body and mind that were considered supernatural. Now I've talked about this intangible, charismatic dimension before. And I'll link to a video that I made on charisma itself because charisma, the, the magical power to affect others is surging to the forefront. And you're beginning to see the manifestations of this in strong men. Strong men that are increasingly resistant to this psychological trap, this attempt to beguile the strong into thinking that they are in fact weak. And that through emasculation, through feminization, through betadization, that we are on the path to utopia, which of course most of you recognize as not being the case. And so resistance is stiffening and mass movements are building. A radicalization of young men is underway. But that is not something to be feared. It is something to be understood and to be led. And these charismatic figures, as Weber said, they're not qualified professionals. They're not minted by the U.S. government. They're not credentialed by academia. And of course, how could they be? But what they are actually doing is they are exercising the psychological demons. They are purging these cancerous psychological infestations and allowing us to cathartically release them. They're empowering us. And they're doing so in a spiritual way, a magical way, a charismatic way. And this effect, you know, the combination of leader and led, the rise of, of these mass movements and neo-masculinity, the rise of masco nationalism around the world, the emergence of new strong men to orchestrate and synchronize these movements and bring people together is a resurrection of masculinity. The future is not going to look like the past, as I've said repeatedly on this channel. And rest assured, that this radicalization was never anticipated. In fact, quite the opposite. If you go back to the 1960s, for instance, and you look at many of the things that were said as the push for feminization and the civil rights movement and political correctness and affirmative action, so forth and so on, 
the intention of all of these things was to fundamentally change the West and despiritualize, emasculate young men. And certainly it has done damage to us. There's no question about it. But in the healing process, men are resurrecting and so is masculinity. Stay tuned for more and we'll talk soon.